Hi, folks. Welcome to another episode of Film Study. This is Ken McCusick. We're here for this week's Know Your Foe in advance of the Steelers game this week, a big one, the third consecutive road division game for the Ravens. Joining me to talk about the Steelers is Alex Kazora. Alex, how are you doing? Hey, Ken. Thanks so much for having me on. I appreciate it. You are a Steelers Depot guy and uh, uh, doing this for your full-time gig now, which is really impressive. The people who can do that, I'm I, uh, terrific at work if you can get it. Yeah, for sure. I celebrated 10 years at Steelers Depot back in August. So very thankful for the opportunity and being able to grow the site. And it's been a lot of fun. You've been consistently outstanding on these Know Your Foe episodes. We always have you on at least once per year. We've had some other people on, different people, Sigmund Bloom, and some other people for the other Steelers episode. But uh, I appreciate getting getting together with you at least once per year on this. So why don't you jump right in and, and tell us a little bit about what's going on. Uh, with the Steelers right now. And I guess the big question we have to start with is who's going to play quarterback this week? Looks like it'll be Kenny Pickett. He spoke with the media today, said he's going to be ready to go. He practiced on a limited basis officially, but it sounds like he's going to be the guy. Pittsburgh and Mike Tomlin said they were going to work him today, see how he moved, how he felt. Really, it's a bone bruise is the official diagnosis. And to my knowledge, that's more of a pain tolerance issue than it is a risk of re-injury or anything like that. Could limit his mobility a bit as well. So I think if all goes well on Thursday, if he wakes up okay, if he can move well enough, not a ton of stiffness, then he should be able to play. So, you know, don't know for sure right now, but my expectation, and seems to be Kenny Pickett's as well, is that Pickett will start on Sunday. So obviously Steeler quarterbacks famous for dealing with pain management issues with, with Ben in particular for all these years. And uh, even the other guys have been pretty tough guys with batch and what Rudolph went through over the years, getting helmets taken apart on the field while he was wearing them and mm -hmm. taken off them and beaten with them. But the, but the uh, thing that, that uh, uh, you know, happened last week, was a little, little bit in the other direction. I did want to ask you a little bit about that in terms of were you a little surprised DTR started over Deshaun Watson in what was a, described as a pain management situation? Now, I'm not, I'm really not privy. Let's start with that to know exactly what the problem <laughs> was. But Watson, apparently, it was his decision. And the Browns said, you know, we back him up on this. Yeah, I'm not as obviously well-versed in Cleveland stuff as I am Pittsburgh-related matters, my expectation through the week and my thought was they were just being cautious with Watson and then he was going to be good to go for Sunday against Baltimore. So it was a surprise for Watson to be inactive for that game and then to go to Dorian Thompson-Robinson. So I don't know all the particulars there, but I just thought from an outside perspective that Watson was going to go given the weight of the game, given that Watson finished out. Uh, the Steelers game and, and those kinds of things. So that that did surprise me, but I don't have enough knowledge to know if I really should have been surprised or not. I think Browns fans had a lot of concern going into that weekend that that he may not play. All right. Now, Pickett or Trubisky at this point right now, now Pickett had an excellent game uh, in week three. Who is the better quarterback in your opinion right now? Well, I mean, it's hard to say for sure. I, all I really can do is focus on Kenny Pickett's play because he's been the starter, will continue to be the starter, and he has not taken the the leap forward that people thought that he would. You know, usually you get that jump year one to year two, Joe Burrow, Trevor Lawrence, I'm sure Lamar went through the same thing, oh, yeah. et cetera. Oh, I think it was his MVP year. Was yep. his year. Yeah. So I was safe to say a big jump there. Um, Pickett has not taken that so far. And there's a bunch of layers to it. But he just regressed in, in, in multiple ways. And I, I'm kind of going all over the place to start, but he needs a consistent run game, an offense that can stay on schedule. Has Have not gotten that overall through the first month of the season. There's been way too many negative plays. They've been backed up too much. But I think Pickett has struggled in two pretty obvious areas. One, his pocket presence has really been poor. He's a guy that has left clean pockets early, and I know the O-line has struggled to keep him upright, and he's been hit a lot, but all he's doing is inviting more pressure and making the O-line's job even harder when you bail on clean pockets. And I think it's been an issue that was that existed his rookie year, and I think it typically gets better for young quarterbacks that are mobile and like to run, but I've not seen that with Pickett so far. He's got to do a better job of navigating and moving 
within the pocket, those subtle small movements, the slide and right. step and hitch, not seeing that from him. Two, and this is more of what teams are doing to him, he's a sideline thrower. He's like Ben. He likes cover one, cover three, throw the back shoulder fade, or throw the jump ball, especially when you have a guy like George Pickens. And defenses are not allowing that to happen this year. They're playing looser coverage. They're really playing over the top. Pickens is not getting vertical. And so it's forced Pickett to throw to other areas of the field, and he's not as comfortable there. So all of that is to say, you know, Trubisky has his strengths, Pickett has his strengths, but Pickett has not made the jump that he needs to, that this team needs him to make throughout the first month of the season. There's been real uh, real regression overall. Now, we've seen some very odd strategies used, including Ben and famously in that 2020 game in Baltimore, bringing the, bringing the Steelers back with a very short passing game to the outside that took advantage of the cornerback weakness the Ravens had. Now, I still believe the Ravens' biggest weakness is probably at corner, even though Marlon Humphrey may come back to play this week. Where they've been exceptionally strong is in the middle of the field with both inside linebackers showing some good coverage traits this year. And more than that, the two safeties being locked down cover two guys. The Ravens are one of those few teams that's blessed with about four free safeties on the team at the same time. And when you have that, you like to play cover two. It really has forced the action underneath. Joe Burrow had no ability to throw the ball deep. What what would you expect Pickett to try and accomplish over the top between level two and three in this game? Well, if they're playing cover two, the weakness in some respect is that hole shot yeah. between where the corner is clouding underneath and the safety playing over the top. So that's going to be the area to try to attack. But with the safeties you guys have at Hamilton and if Marcus Williams comes back, it's going to be tough to try to squeeze some of those throws. I think big picture, I don't have any empirical data to back it up. Pickett has struggled against zone more than man. I think he likes the man. It's a little bit cleaner, easier read for him pre-snap zone. The picture gets a little bit more muddied in. I think he struggles to decipher. I think additionally, he's kind of locked onto his first read and not gotten off his first read often enough. So, I mean, if you're facing, you know, two man, then you look for the outside, you know, outbreaking routes to the sideline. You're facing cover two. You're trying to, you know, in theory, attack the middle of the field with the linebackers that can run. That's going to be a challenge with Queen and Smith, and you're attacking that hole between the safety and the corner. Okay. All right. Outstanding. Uh, let's move on and talk a little bit about the current state of the offensive line. You mentioned Pickett was having some problems getting protected in this year. The Ravens have, I think, gone through some good fortune to face some lines that didn't really have it together. They're up near the top of the league in sacks right now. They're fourth. Um, and a, some of that is due to the fact that the offensive lines just really haven't been continuous units. Yeah, it's been an issue in Pittsburgh, too. And I feel like, Ken, we probably have the same conversation each year where the O-line just not quite there. And maybe maybe next year is the year. And it's frustrating because they've made a lot of attempts to upgrade the offensive line. I mean, they have drafted with first-round pick Broderick Jones, who will make his first start at left tackle this weekend. Dan Moore's already been ruled out with a right knee injury. They've had free agent additions along the interior offensive line in Isaac Sayamalu at left guard, Mason Cole at center, James Daniels at right guard. Daniels' health is questionable this week. He missed the week four game, did not practice on Wednesday. If he can't go, Nate Herbig will get the start. He struggled in his first Steelers start against the Texans. So you've had new pieces, you've had veterans, you've had rookies. And the improvement has not been there. I thought Houston did a great job with their stunts. And Pittsburgh struggled to communicate and pass off and pick some of those things up. And the line overall has just not been consistent enough, whether that's assignment-related stuff in the run game where linebackers are running free. Pittsburgh's zone scheme has been pretty poor this year. The linemen are slanting and penetrating, getting a feel and disrupting. The man stuff has been a bit better, but just on the whole, you thought this line would be better than where it currently sits uh definitely not a case where the ravens have been particularly healthy at edge uh oa is not going to play this week uh ajabo now the talk is that he's going to miss the rest of the season although they haven't confirmed that yet i think harbaugh said he, he needs to make a decision which to me likely means he has to decide on whether surgery now or try and get mm -hmm. through and have surgery at the end of the year either which are bad uh, choices but they've got now Kyle Van Noy uh, brought in off the street, who had a very good first game for the Ravens. And uh, uh, Clowney, who's providing a ton of pressure, seems to be almost like a 
ugly duckling reborn as a swan in terms of better pass rush characteristics playing from outside linebacker as opposed to playing from a 4-3 edge, a 4-3 uh, end slot. Yeah, I know that Clowney, his time in Cleveland soured, to say the least, and they weren't happy with his production. I haven't gotten eyes really on the Ravens' defense in my tape study yet. That's going to be later tonight and into tomorrow. But, you know, you guys always scheme it up well. You guys always have talented pass rushers, and, yeah, you've had some injuries there. But, you know, I think Broderick Jones' left tackle is going to be big. And to be fair to him, it was his first extensive action last week, and he got he got thrown into the fire. He didn't start that game or got hurt in the first quarter. So you're kind of coming off the bench. And I think it's tough for a lineman to do because, you know, when you're the backup lineman, you're kind of planning for the guys that are on both sides. And when you're the starting left tackle, you can plan for the guys that are going to be a right defensive end, right outside linebacker and can really study those matchups. And you have the first team reps and all those kinds of things. So he's athletic. He's a good run blocker. He's aggressive. Got to use his hands better. The technique was not yeah. there. Um, I thought guys got into his body too often. He probably overset a couple times as well. So they're going to test him, I'm sure, with some twists and games and see how he reacts overall. Okay. Well, it won't be any worse than the Ravens tackle situation, believe me on that. But uh, Dan Moore had not been playing particularly well to start the season either. And I know developmental tackle drafted, what, 21 he was drafted or 22? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, 21 fourth round. Okay. So actually kind of similar to Falele in terms of, of you know, what you'd expect Falele a year later, um, but, but a fourth round guy and, you know, a, a, certainly a developmental tackle. Uh, and he's now got a spot for the Ravens, but, but talk a little bit, I guess Dan Moore is not going to play in this game. Where are you in terms of Moore as far as, yeah, there's still a hope or, or uh, the, the Dan Moore project is in a lot of trouble. Probably looking at swingman status for him, although he has limited experience on the right side. Um, he's a really hard worker. I thought he had a good summer. He beat out Broderick Jones, which I think people weren't expecting. Jones, first-run rookie tackle, those guys typically don't sit very long. And more, I thought, really played well and, and, and showed some growth. His biggest issue has always been dealing with power and bull rushes. It's just never been the anchor isn't there the the technique, the hand use isn't there. And I thought he would get better at that this year. And it it hadn't seen now to be fair to him, he had faced a murderer's row of guys to start the year. Nick Bosa in week one, Miles Garrett in week two, and actually saw more Max Crosby in week three than what I expected. Uh, They moved him around more than they typically do. So you knew it was not going to be sunshine, sunshine and flowers when you're facing those kinds of guys. And then he gets hurt in week four. So you never really got a chance to evaluate him against the non freaking nature that makes the evaluation probably a bit skewed, but um, I, I'd probably say with Jones, he's going to start you know, next year. He's going to be your guy. We'll see what happens to right tackle with Chuck Luma core for. He's got a roster bonus due in March. We'll see if the team picks it up, but I think this team's going to keep trying to swing away at different offensive linemen until they kind of find a group that, that really fits. Now you're on a, a first contract basis with with Pickett, obviously, and and I've, uh, I, they're paying something for Trubisky. Do you approximate? What's the approximate earning? It's a good chunk. I think it's eight million is his base salary this year. They okay. gave him an extension. Still, that's that's backup money all yeah, the for way for quarterback so, money. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so it's not bad in that. So there's other money to be spent. Where where are the Steelers taking their big swings in the off season? This upcoming off season, you're asking about, or or, or the last or one, either one. Yeah, well, it's been interesting. They've been heavily allocated towards defense because there was a stretch for seven straight years. They drafted a defensive player in the first round, and so you had to pay those guys. You had to pay a T.J. Watt and pay a Mink if it's Patrick, who granted was not their draft pick, but a guy they traded for a rookie contract had to pay him. Uh, the, the offensive rookies have been more recent picks. When you talk about Pat Fryermuth, Najee Harris, Kenny Pickett, George Pickens, those are cheap guys because they're on the rookie contracts. That bill will come due in, in a couple of years. Fry, or excuse me, really, there is no major free agent after this year. You could talk contract extension with Pat Fryermuth. Tight end, tight end markets really heated up with who all got paid, Cole Komet, and TJ Hawkinson. So that price has gone up. Fryermuth uh, currently hurt. He's not expected to, uh, to play in this game with a hamstring injury. So we'll see how the rest of the season goes. Um, so the money's really been allocated defensively. They have put some money in the O-line and Cole and Daniels and say Malu, not major contracts, but, but decently paid contracts overall. Um, it, it's, it's been interesting though, because once Ben came off the books, you had some money to play with, which is typically not a situation Pittsburgh was in. So they've been able to spend more money in for agency. 
but I would say the weight of the cap space is in the defense right now. Right. Okay. And and it's certainly the opposite of the Ravens with the with the Lamar contract really swinging the scales there, obviously. Sure. But uh, uh, interesting. All right. So can you take us across the offensive line once in terms of of what kind of quality we're talking about each of those five positions? I know you sure. started left tackle and we kind of stayed there. Roderick Jones, left tackle. Again, I think a rocky debut or really extent. He played four snaps in week one, but extensive action in in, in uh, this past game. But I think with a full week of, of reps, that's going to be good for him. Left guard, say Malu. He's been solid. He's a you know, big guy. He's strong, great anchor, hard guy to bull rush, have to try to go around him as opposed to going through him. The run blocking probably hasn't been as dominant as you would hope for, but he's probably been their best and most consistent offensive lineman. Center Mason Cole thought he was solid last year, stable, played hurt, played tough. He's been disappointing this year. Now, maybe he's dealing with something I don't know, but I think he's really had a, a really taken steps back. I can't explain exactly why, but the play has not been very good. Now, right guard, if it's James Daniels, then then it, you know we'll see on him. He's got a groin injury. Um, he's been okay. Again, didn't think he put, he's, he's taken the leap that I expected that he would. If he can't go, Nate Herbig will start. He's your classic mauling, run blocker, pass protection, a big issue with him. And then right tackle Chuck Wumakor for the veteran, the longest tenured guy of the starting five. He's been okay. He's he's solid. He's never great. He's never terrible. I think it's been just a, an average year for a core for at right tackle, which is probably how you can describe the bulk of his career. Okay. All right. Very cool. Uh, wide receiver. The, the Steelers have had tremendous success developing them. The Ravens could never seem to do it. Hmm. They end up on a free agent treadmill year after year. Tell us how about, about the wide receiving core. Well, Deontay Johnson will not play. He's on IR. He's out until at least after the bye in week number seven. So that leaves George Pickens as the the top and clear number one option. I think what Pickens has shown is, you know, last year he was the vertical guy. And that's such a, he's got a, such an aptitude for making those downfield crazy one-handed, you know, catches. But he was really just that vertical guy. He really couldn't align in different places. He couldn't run a route tree. You saw progression from him this year. I saw that in training camp. He's able to, you know, be aligned in the slot to work over the middle, to run the dig, to run the slant, to get yards after the catch. Last year, he was the NFL's worst yak receiver, in part because he was a vertical guy and those routes don't lend itself to yak the way that the, you know, short and intermediate routes do. So I've seen his game grow and he's really rounded out the edges of his game. And that's really been a good thing because, as, as I said earlier, Teams have taken away the deep ball, the vertical shots. He's really not had, I don't know if he's had really one true sideline jump ball opportunity this year. He's had a, a post route. He's had some stuff near the, the goal line, but not the stuff we were seeing routinely last year. So he's really had to work other areas of the field. And thankfully he's done that, uh, but he's commanded a lot of attention too, because he's seeing all the safeties in corners rolling to him to take him away. I see he's averaged about 9.1 yards per catch this year. So that's that's back in good territory, certainly. You'd, you'd love to have some receivers at 10 or more. But to me, nine for a Ravens guy anyway is great. Uh, for, for a Steelers, I don't know how you guys feel <laughs> about it. But uh, but it's a he's he's been fairly effective. And so he's got to be getting some yak if it's all short routes and he's at 9.1 yards per target. Yeah, for Pickens, I, I don't know the exact route trade. I don't know his exact A dot. Um, I mean, he's done, you know, he had a big 71 yard touchdown against Cleveland that was a slant. They were playing off coverage and he was able to uh, make hay downfield. So that was probably like 50 yards of yak on that play. So again, I've seen progression, I've seen growth from him, but teams have really taken away this team's fastball when it comes to Pickens in terms of the vertical, you know, deep shots. They've just not really allowed that. So, and again, like I said earlier, the team, because Deontay's out, you can just take away George Pickens. You're taking away their top target, and that makes you know you, you, teams obviously would rather take Pickens away and make Calvin Austin, Allen Robinson, those guys beat you as opposed to Pickens being singled up. So that's been one of the issues for this past game. All right, uh, other wide receivers you want to talk about? Yeah, there's still you know some guys stepping up. Allen Robinson's your crafty veteran, you know, third down, sit versus zone, run the option route, blocking type of guy. He's been. As advertised, the numbers are as expected, probably sitting around nine and a half, ten 10 yards per catch. The one game breaker is Calvin Austin, who fourth round pick from 2022, missed his entire rookie year with a foot injury. Wondered if he was going to have that speed because he was a 4-3-2 guy coming out of Memphis, and he's certainly shown that speed. He's hit a 72-yard touchdown 
against the Raiders. They've taken a lot of vertical shots his way, so he's the guy that's probably seen the biggest uptick in snaps since Deontay Johnson went down. But he's a guy with a limited catch radius and probably hasn't been able to work in in the short and shallow game as much as you would hope. He also gets work in the run game in terms of jet sweeps and those type of receiver runs. All right. All right. Your gadget guy. Very good. Uh, talk about tight ends a little bit. With Fire, Fire Muth out, where does that uh, burden fall to? Darnell Washington, the rookie. And it was really fortunate and surprising to see him fall into the third round. Thought he was going to be a potential day one, early day two type of tight end. I think the strength of the tight end class, there were, I don't know what, 10 tight ends taken in the, the top two days, I think. And also there were some reported concerns about his knees in terms of the medical that caused him to fall. So he's the, he's only caught one pass this year, only even targeted one time. That was in the Houston game, uh, a little play action out there in the flat for, for 10 yards and a first down. So he's really been a blocker for second and third. Um, it's been inconsistent, but he's going to be the number one guy this week with Friar Muth out. I just, I want to say this because I absolutely loved him coming out of Georgia. I, I, he was, I think third on my tight end list and, most of the receiving guys, they didn't do a whole lot for me. I know there's been some good performances from those tight ends, but he is the most obvious tackle conversion I have ever <laughs> seen from tight end. The most obvious. He's just natural. And the only thing I think that could really get in the way is, well, there's there's things about technique. It might be hard to teach. You might not want to do it. You know, there's things like that. But but if if the knees are really a continuously a problem, I guess that could be an issue. But the knees are a bigger thing that would hold him back from being a tight end. <laughs> so True. it's still probably a pretty good chance. Right. Trying to put on that weight a little dicey. We'll see. Mm-hmm. You know, you never know for sure in those medical things. You've had medical guys and, and they've you know been fine. So you never know exactly how a career is going to look long term. His blocking, it's been what I thought. And and while he's got the size and his length is ridiculous and he's just this you know freak of nature when he gets off the, the bus. It's been inconsistent. What he's good at is angles. When he when he has an angle and can down block and wash guys down, that's when he wins. Because the dude's 6'7", 260 with 34-inch arms. I mean, you know, that, that's going to move some people in the NFL. But on some of those head-up base blocks where he's got to work and fight his leverage and get low and win with pad level, had some issues there. And so I think the blocking is a work in progress as he really refines his technique. Something he was pretty good at at Georgia, but, you know, you don't have that many um, reps of him actually blocking on plays well, you got to watch a lot of tape to get those reps anyway. But how much of a job, good job did he do on being a very positional blocker in level two? Because the guy's his size, boy, if if you just maintain your position against that, what is generally a much smaller man, even a linebacker, you're gonna you're gonna have a lot, you're gonna have a big advantage. And Miles Boy can be a perfect example, and you guys now know him well mm-hmm. um, in in terms of a guy who could maintain position very well in level two. Is Washington that guy? You're asking from what I've seen in Pittsburgh so yeah. far. I really haven't gotten a lot of clips of that because they face a lot of four, three teams. You know, when you're talking about the Raiders and the Niners and uh, Cleveland, which is a bit more of a multiple front, but they certainly run a lot of four down stuff. And so Pittsburgh's mission has been to take Washington and have him help double team or block or wash down some of those four, three defensive ends. So there's not been a lot of him climbing to the second level and getting hats on linebackers. So I really probably couldn't give you a good answer, but on paper, you would expect a guy of his size to get in the way and probably move some of those, especially in this day and age where you got these linebackers that are just safeties, you know, they're just 220 yeah. pounds and, and you can just move those guys around in the run game. So I imagine it's something he'll be able to do if he cleans up his technique and his pad level, but just not really gotten a lot of opportunities to see it this year. All right. Very good. Well, uh, let's move on and talk running backs. There's been a big debate in Pittsburgh. It's been a little annoying, to be honest with you. The Najee Harris versus Jalen Warren discussion. Who's the better back? Who should get carries? I'm happy with how these guys are working. Harris is the first and second down back. Warren is the third down passing situations back. I think they complement each other really well. The run game overall has not been as successful as it needs to be. They caught some traction in the second half of the Houston game. I thought Harris has really run hard this year and probably not given enough credit for the job that he's done. Uh, Warren's a little firecracker. He's a guy that's you know going to run through you at every occasion. He's never going to go out of bounds. Um, he's an ass out of the pass game. He's a really good pass protector overall. Recognition technique, getting the job done. So I think they have two talented backs that are splitting. I think Harris is at around fifty five percent of the snaps, and and Warren about forty five. Uh, Warren has a bunch of catches. Harris only has a couple. Warren's carries aren't significantly high, so. I mean, you can kind of call Harris the more rundown guy and, and Warren the more pass down type of running back. 
So a lot of missed, uh, missed tackles forced I'm seeing on the ledger for Najee Harris so far this year. That's got to be uh, gratifying to see at this point. It is. He's run hard. Now, I think a lot of those came against Houston because he was really churning out tough yards. I think he broke six tackles against the Texans. I think it's the bulk of where, and I know broken tackles, depending on where you get the, the research from, they probably differ a bit. But point is, a lot of that came against Houston. So he's run hard. He's had to run hard because they've had a lot of negativity. I don't know what the number is coming out of the Texans game, but I know going into it, they led the NFL with the most negative runs at around 31% in terms wow. of runs that got zero or lost yardage, and that excludes kneel down. So there was a lot of negativity that's backing this offense up and forcing the play second and third and long. I'm, I'm noticing that his, his yards after contact per attempt were, were okay uh, at 3.16, but that's really just middle of the pack for the, for the, for the top people. Do I have that right? But anyway, my, my, but the point is that with a you know modest uh, yards per carry, there's been a lot. Of, it's pretty clear there's been a lot of contact in the backfield. Yeah, I mean for him, I think his yards per carry, just the baseline number is four point three or so, yep. which is better than his. He's been under four yards his first two years, so it's actually been an uptick. But it's been tough sledding for sure because the lanes have rarely been there. They they they, they have a varied run scheme and they they changed things up the last couple of weeks. They run some of these wham blocks or crunch, which is a basically a double wham block. It's a really quick hitting play. And so the run scheme is, I think, opened up a bit more the last two weeks. They've kind of gotten away from the, the zone stuff because they've really been poor with their inside zone run scheme and focused more on some of these wham blocks and, and man and duo type stuff. So there's been some traction, but again, needs to be more. How, how about uh, Warren as a pass blocker? If he's on the field most on, on passing downs, Ravens obviously run a lot of blitzes and he might be assigned to pick up a linebacker or potentially a safety. Uh, how, how does he stand up there he's done really well and that's a big reason why he took over that role because harris in his rookie year he was the workhorse he was the three down back never leave the field kind of guy and they bring in warren in 2022 as his undrafted for agent this essential unknown it's funny he someone asked him one time what made you sign with pittsburgh was it the opportunity on the depth chart or the coach he's like they just offered me the most money they gave him twelve thousand dollars as a signing bonus he said all right i'm coming um, the first time I noticed Jalen Warren in training camp was in a backs on backers drill. The first day in pads, Pittsburgh, every day they, they go in pads for the first day of camp. They run backs on backers, a one V one linebacker blitz running back pickup. And usually a rookie in there, they're a little nervous. They don't do well, but Warren was fearless and awesome. Like he executed well and his pass protection was great. That's the first time you notice this dude and that pass pro has carried on throughout his career. I, I'll just say this, and Alex, I'm sure you'll back me up. If you go to camp, whether you're there as a fan or you're or you're there as a reporter for some some website or whatever it might be, that drill is one of the only ones that gets run at 100 percent during camp. In fact, they have oftentimes in in Baltimore when they do it. First of all, they put it over in the middle of the field so nobody can see see it too well from the sideline. Mm -hmm. So they they're 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 trying to hide it. <laughs> and then they have like a hockey line at the end of it where everybody shakes hands. You're supposed to, you know, get back good with your teammates after you take them out during this drill. <laughs> but, you know, it's a it's a high intensity drill that they're that they're running there. It's it's a little bit akin to the Oklahoma drill. And in some past uh, uh, hard knocks things, we've seen that built up by linemen in terms of of uh, ways that they, uh, uh, you know, big drills that for, for them on any in any given camp. Sure. It's a christening in Pittsburgh. They run backs on backers twice in camp the first day in pads and usually do it the Friday night lights practice, which is their big, you know, under the lights. They go to a high school field and they, they usually run it then. So but but yeah, Warren is a very good pass protection back. He's a good cat, you know, out of the backfield. He's a, he's a hair on fire kind of guy. He's the ultimate chip on his shoulder. Dude's five eight, but he's short, not small. Dude is rocked up. And I just love the story. I mean, he was snow college to Utah State, to Oklahoma State, to undrafted to make the team, to earn a role, and to now, you know, be a big contributor for the Steelers. And so he's just a, a good guy, good guy to root for, and he's carved out a really nice role. All right. All right. Outstanding. In terms of personnel now, are they primarily an 11 team or do they ever go heavy and show anything else, whether it's a, a, a true 21 or a 21 with a with a with uh, a uh, either a lineman or a, or a tight end in the backfield? They have basically run only two personnel groupings this year, 11 and 12. They mm -hmm. don't have a true fullback on the team. And they had their third tight ends. He's a, he's a tight end, but he's Connor Hayward. He's 5'11". He's more of this H-back. I don't want to call him use check or anything like that. But he's, you know, he's not going to be a true inline Y blocker. Whenever he blocks, it's split flow. He's trying to cut guys. He's not obviously going to base block 
the way that Adorno Washington will. So they've not really gone those ultra heavy packages. It's been, you know, very high concentration of 11 and 12 personnel. So that's very interesting to me because there's been a lot of question about whether this week Kyle Hamilton will move back to nickel again. I kind of think he will. I, I think that they'll uh, reduce Mollet snaps or even though he played very well in the first game that, that he might be the odd man out in what is now a fairly deep secondary. Um, and with Stone and Marcus Williams playing on the back end, that Hamilton may come up and play nickel again. That gives the Ravens the most vulnerable nickel pack. Uh, sorry, vulnerable, um, versatile nickel package you could possibly have. You can put that on against 11 or 12. You never have to get out of it. And they basically never have this year. Mm. They played about 90% of their snaps in a nickel. They're, they're, they're the most committed nickel team that I've ever seen the Ravens have. They don't even go to base very often, 9.4%. Wow. Uh, and they've been three dime snaps so far this year. That's the only other deviation from that they so, used to be a pretty big dime team weren't oh they? yeah they six feet dbs like chuck clark and all those guys yep. that was kind of their, yep. their personality yeah and and i love that by the way because my basic philosophy is your third best safety can always cover better than your second best linebacker right no. so it, anyway well i was gonna say yeah it's interesting you're kind of seeing that maybe a bit more I, I know buffalo for i don't know if they still are but they've been a nickel personality like teron johnson mm-hmm. was a guy that never left the field and when pittsburgh had mike hilton they were a pretty heavy nickel team the raiders are a very nickel heavy team with nate hobbs mm-hmm. as that third guy so you're kind of seeing maybe this the shift league wide to try to roll that three safety package yeah it's uh uh you, there, there are definitely other places they're using it but the, the the reason that they don't do it here is that because patrick queen needs to be on the field every every sure. down I wasn't a big, I didn't feel like that needed to happen back when Patrick Queen didn't really have his head on straight in terms of coverage, but now he's got it together and he, he's, he's playing a lot better in coverage and it's important to have him on as a pass rusher and run to the football and make plays downhill. And he's going to earn some big money next year that you won't be with the Ravens. I don't think, but, uh, mm. but he's going to earn a big, big contract. Good for him. Cause I know we, every, yeah. every time we talk about how is Queen doing, it's been hit and miss, maybe getting better. So I'm yeah. glad he's figured it all out. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's definitely, he's having a big year. Uh, all right. So what do we got next? We want to talk about any other common plays or formations they run a lot, or, uh, you know, maybe in terms of, of route concepts or anything. Well, don't get me started on, on common plays. Cause it feels like this playbook <laughs> is, is limited and there's a whole debate on Twitter. And I'm sure Ravens fans are well aware of the Matt Canada hate and the, the urge for fans to want him to be fired. And probably his last year's contract is up after this year. So I won't go down that rabbit hole too much. I just think, Pittsburgh has playbook has been more limited than it needs to be than it should be in their sequence of uh, sweet sequencing of plays and how they call plays has been too repetitive where they're so gung ho on trying to go back to a play if they get the right look and defenses adjust and just they're not they're running the same stuff and it looks the same usually teams that have these constrained plays they're going to run the same concept but at at a different formation or add some wrinkle to it so it doesn't look the exact same they dress it up I don't think Pittsburgh has done that well enough overall. Again, the big layered conversation about, you know, how they handle this type of stuff. But certainly, I think schematically, they're not elevating anyone's game right now. All right. All right. Very good. Uh, The Ravens. Aaron Rodgers season is officially over, but yours has just begun at my bookie. NFL, college ball and the brand new cash out system gives you options to bet and win all season long. First two legs of your parlay hit, cash out early and place another bet or let it ride for a chance at a bigger payday. Join us at MyBookie for an entire season filled with daily odd boosts, same game parlays, and huge prize pool contests. Right now, MyBookie has a no strings attached cash bonus that lets you deposit and withdraw quick. Use the promo code RAVENS on your first deposit of $50 or more and you can receive up to $200 in cash instantly credited to your MyBookie account. That's promo code RAVENS to claim your cash bonus now. You can bet anything, anytime, anywhere, only with MyBookie. Weakness at cornerback is, I don't think it's trivial anymore, even though the guys have have played well. Stevens has, has played pretty well to start the season, and he's been the guy they've given every snap to. On the other side, Darby and uh, Yasin have split time, and both of them are extraordinary in terms of yards per target. So things have gone well for the defense overall. I think it is really team-based that basically cover two has forced all the action up front and that, that the cornerbacks have really benefited from that happening. Pressure has been pretty decent, so things have worked out f- from that perspective. But if if you're looking at this set of cornerbacks, the Ravens, how do you think the Steelers will attack it? Um, 
It's hard to say overall. I, again, I have not done the deep dive into the Ravens defense so far. I think for Pittsburgh, it's trying to focus more on what they do well than trying to necessarily attack any particular weakness that Baltimore may or may not have. Um, you know, they, they've taken their vertical shots with Calvin Austin. If they can get the right look, cover two, or if the safety rolls over to double George Pickens, they'll take some of those deep shots. Um, the passing game just overall has been really clunky, and it's been hard to get into a rhythm and find some plays that are go-to overall. Like I said earlier, it's been a more the the shorter intermediate game because teams are taking away those vertical opportunities for a guy like George Pickens. And so Pittsburgh has tried to creatively move him around and change his alignment and expand his route tree. So I don't know if there's any one particular thing they're going to do to attack the corners as it is just trying to find some early down success. You're going to see some you know, a lot of spacing concepts and some of these sprint outs to kind of get, you know, cheap, easy yardage. That's what Pittsburgh's trying to do to get into a rhythm to sustain drives because they have not sustained drives really at all throughout the first month of, uh, month of the season. All right. All right. Now, the uh, big plays on defense have been a lot of their success against against teams like Cincinnati, right, When in the win. I'm, I'm thinking about the right game or I'm thinking of Cleveland, that they had two touchdowns on. That was Cleveland. The Browns, right? yeah, the Browns yeah. game, yep. Yeah, they, they, they when they have hit, they've hit big. It's kind of been a very much a feast famine type of offense where you got seventy one yards to Pickens, you got seventy two yards to Austin. They've not again not been able to sustain those drives. So they're really only method. I think they only have four offensive touchdowns this year. So I mean, they've only run a, you know a handful of plays in the red zone. So it's really been when they hit, it's the seventy plus yard type of touchdown. All right, let's flip it over to the defense here. Uh, I always like to talk about this, and I know it doesn't change too much from year to year per team, but remind us of what the Steelers do in terms of their common base looks and on on passing downs, uh, what they're looking against a a typical 11 personnel set, which now the Ravens are um, Mm -hmm. where they weren't in the past. Right, it's a new conversation, new OC, better receivers. I was watching their tape earlier. It's been fun to watch their offense in the the past game. Uh, Yeah, they're, you know, base 3-4 team against 11. They're going to be nickel team. what they do, I should note, uh, for, for nickel, because there's been some change there, is now this may change because I think Pittsburgh realizes they got to make some adjustments. But so far, it's been Shandon Sullivan, who was with I think Minnesota last year, or Green Bay. I always uh, mix up what team he was a part of. He's their nickel guy in dime packages. Patrick Peterson, who got signed this offseason, will shift inside and play slot. And that's when they bring out Joey Porter Jr., the rookie corner out of Penn State. So. Mm. Um, there's some mixing and matching going on there, but yeah, they basically match your personnel um, unless they have a real intent to take away the run that they may stay in their three, four against 11 personnel did that versus the Raiders, for example, but they're generally, you know, third and six plus dime, 11 personnel, nickel, heavy personnel to be in the base three, four, or maybe occasionally go with a three safety package or something a little heavier defensively. Okay, so you're you're saying it's it's mostly a four corner dime, obviously with Peterson, and you mentioned uh, also bringing in Joey, Joey Porter. Is that the only playing time Porter is getting, by the way, is is in dime packages? Well, it's it's a three-corner, three-safety dime package. Sullivan okay. comes off the field. Peterson kicks to the slot. Porter at left corner. Wallace at right corner. And then three safeties, Minka Fitzpatrick, yeah. DeMonte Casey, Keanu Neal. But yeah, so far, who's, Porter who's is the up safety. Neal, typically, is yeah. kind of the dime safety. And then Casey and Minka play in the back end. They rotate and spin. Peterson does as well. Um, but yeah, so far Porter has only played in dime packages and that may change. I think Pittsburgh has hinted at some things may get adjusted. They may have Desmond King, uh, play in the slot. Some he's not played any, uh, defensive snaps this year for the Steelers. So I don't want to cement things cause I know things may be changing, but yes, yeah, so far Porter has only played in dime and because Pittsburgh has bl- been blown out in half their games, he's not gotten to play that much. Offenses are dictating how much he's playing because they're not you know, playing catch up. And so there's an urgency to get him on the field more often. What, what about putting him in, in, in some of the blowout games just on the outside to replace the starters? They, they haven't done it. They just rolled yeah. with the guys and have, they've not pulled any of their starters, even in these blowouts. They're just letting the, the starters it's, it's finish like things up. <laughs> <laughs> I guess overall, I mean, what they've done is they, they wanted to limit the menu of snaps that Porter has had to absorb and just focus on some of those passing situations. And so I get that. And in some way it helps because whenever you're the dime guy, every situation is high leverage. There's no run yeah. up the middle, you know, where you just kind of stand there and watch it go by. Um, you're playing in third and long, you're playing end the half and the game two minutes. So you're always in these high leverage weighty moments. You do grow up that way, but I think it's time to expand his role. 
So people have never really understood that about the importance of having a great dime is just the leverage of every play that guy that guy plays. And in Baltimore, I will say this one of the great things about Ozzy Newsom is he always knew how to find excellent cheap dime backs in the sixth round or later, sixth round, seventh round, undrafted free agent or incredibly cheap free agent on the market. Um, and always found undervalued assets there, and it allowed them to do these platoon linebacker situations, which were much cheaper than having a second guy you're paying. Who were some of those? I'm trying to think back. Clark was okay, one of go. them. Was yeah. Jefferson? Uh, he got later in his career. Was he yeah. ever part of that? Jeff- Jefferson was a was a dime late in his career. In fact, he was a quarter late in his career. But I'll go back to the very beginning because I like love naming the list. Please, please. R- Ralph Staten was a seventh round pick in the Ravens' very first draft. Uh, they had Benny Thompson was the quarterback who came in and for 116 snaps replaced Ray Lewis in 1996. Mm. Uh, so he's a he's a Pro Bowl special team. I don't know if he had some time with the Steelers too at some point. What was his name? Benny Thompson. I don't think Does so. Ring a bell? I mean, okay, maybe, then he, he might not wrong. have been. Then the Corey Harris, who was who was one of the Ravens' best ever. He played four seasons with the Ravens as a and ended up being the being the uh, strong safety you know, in his last year. Uh, then they had uh, Haruki Nakamura was after him, but mm. I'm missing one. Uh, Anthony Mitchell, who returned the the he's better known for returning the uh, blocked kick for the touchdown against Tennessee in 2000 playoffs. But uh, they, they've had Anthony Levine, a very big one, including a huge That's what I'm of. Yeah. yeah game. At Did that a uh, Notre Dame guy? Uh, Tom, what was his name? Zivikowski. Zivikowski? Was he you know, that kind of guy? He, didn't, no? he would have been, but he didn't really work out. And he's a fireman, I think, in Chicago now. So I think. Oh, he, he, yeah, he. Uh, he gave it up. He tried to be a boxer, and then he and then he ended up being a fireman. That's a classic yeah. thing. A, a, a Tom Zbikowski from Notre Dame yeah. turned boxer. Yeah, that that tracks. <laughs> that tracks so well. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Wonderful. Let's let's talk. Move to the defensive line a little bit. Talk a little bit about rotation, depth, snap management. One of the things when I think about the Pittsburgh Steelers, I always I always go back to is how they tend to overwork interior down linemen, and they they're great players. I mean, Aaron Smith, Cam Hayward, to it. All those guys, fantastic players, Kiesel, uh, but they but they tend to give them such incredible snap burdens. How are they rotating this year? Well, to, just off the top, you have to acknowledge that Cam Hayward's not playing in this game, and mm-hmm. he is can such a big loss. Needless to say, but it gets hurt in Week One. He's on IR. Don't know exactly when he's going to return, and the run defense has struggled significantly because of of his absence. So again, I, I don't want to cement some of these things because I think things are changing in Pittsburgh. But base defense. One Travis Adams, atypical nose tackle, kind of more of athletic one gapper type of guy in the middle. Larry Ogan Joby at left defensive end, right defensive end is Hayward spot. It's been fluid to say the least. The Marvin Lee Allison concussion protocol. Isaiah Loudermilk, the uh, mid round pick out of Wisconsin, has not played well. He's losing time. Could be the rookie Keanu Benton out of Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. He's been a nose tackle primarily, but played some base end snaps last weekend against Houston. And there's been some depth chart shifting that may signal that Benton's going to actually see some base defensive end snaps. He was a base defensive end early in his Badgers career, so there's some experience mm-hmm. there. So that may be your base front with guys like uh, Leal, Loudermilk, rotating behind. Yeah, he, he, Benton was a ex, he was one of the exciting defensive linemen. It wasn't a great class, I didn't think, top to bottom, but he was one of the guys I liked uh, in this draft. Um all right. Uh, how about uh, talk a little bit about the, the the pass rushers, the edge rushers here, and and uh, how that time is split? Certainly the strength of the team, as I'm sure Ravens fans are well aware of, depth is better this year. But T.J. Watt, Alex Highsmith, those guys have been fantastic this year. Watt has six sacks. Highsmith's stats aren't there, but the pressure's been there. He's played well overall. And the issue they've had in the past is a lack of depth. When Watt went down last year, pass rush totally tanked. There's better depth this year. Marcus Golden, the veteran rotational guy play plays both sides uh power guy good run defender high effort high motor type of dude veteran with a bunch of pedigree he's been signed and they drafted the rookie also from wisconsin nick herbig who's been a uh, rotational guy too uh, undersized but feisty hair on fire type of dude a lot of special team snaps for him and so those guys have rotated behind so i think overall of course you got stars and studs at the top with better depth behind well, that's uh, that's uh, just a really sucky to hear. I got to tell you, the, <laughs> not, not that I didn't know it's true, but but the 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 Ravens have a lot of trouble protecting the quarterback right now, and they lost uh, Morgan Moses, who'd been doing a good job, and uh, they have now uh, Daniel Falele, who probably still does not belong on an NFL field at this point. He's a developmental lineman in his second year, and I, I I think if I have to make one prediction for this game going in, is that the Ravens will run a lot of unbalanced line. They used to do this a lot in the past. And they've done some this year 
where they take the opportunity to tuck a less mobile lineman with good size and Falele definitely meets that those mm-hmm. characteristics in terms of being a very you know very big and not particularly physical frankly player um, that they could tuck him in inside of McCarry on one side and have Zeitler effectively uh, play right tackle and maybe even pull move the pocket if you're passing you, you've got a lot of things you can do. Um, but it's it's just it's a very limiting situation, extremely limiting situation. And to watch them have to work against Miles Garrett and Zadarius Smith last week was was very frustrating. The, the Ravens offense they're extremely efficient in the red zone, but but they've been tremendously inefficient uh, the last two weeks in terms of getting first downs. You know, just, just moving the chains on a regular basis. They've only gotten sixty eight percent first downs uh, the last two weeks, so that's been a that's been a frustration. Yeah, Pittsburgh's going to win this game. It's going to be with their pass rush. That's how they beat the Browns. You know, you get the strip sack fumble end of that game. They go ahead and touch down. So, you know, Pittsburgh certainly has their problems, but pass rush overall is not one of them. Now, Houston had a great game plan, and we'll see how much Baltimore takes from that. Not that Baltimore is unfamiliar with how to plan for Pittsburgh's pass rush, but obviously the Texans, the perimeter run game, staying on schedule, screen game, play action, really slow down Pittsburgh's pass rush. He's a, he's a Stroud, not sacked a single time despite all the Texans offensive line injury. So we'll see if Baltimore can pull uh, anything from that. But yeah, I mean, Watt and Highsmith, those guys are still studs. Just, just as an aside, how, how good does CJ Stroud seem? I, I, so I, I really looked that first game and I said, Oh my God, they, you know, they, they didn't intercept Stroud once. He only had one fumble. He, he basically had a decent game throwing the football. Otherwise this does not look good for this defense. And now we find out Stroud's a franchise quarterback. It appears. Yeah, I mean, this guy looks, I know it's only four games, but he looks like just a stud. The accuracy, the touch, the reads. I mean, this guy, I, I think it's safe to say Houston has their guy. Mm-hmm. Do, it, it, would you, you think it's safe to say, even with how well Richardson has played and some of the flashes he's shown, that they got the best of the th- the big three quarterbacks? It, it might be too early to make that proclamation. I mean, Richardson is a bit of a work in progress. I don't know if he was as raw as some people thought he was coming out. I think his pocket presence and mobility was better than expected. I think he's in a really good system with Shane Steichen that knows how to utilize his strengths well. Um, it, it may be a Richardson versus Stroud type of thing. Richardson is, is the more toolsy guy, the, the freak of nature, obviously. Stroud's a bit more the you know within the pocket, structured type of dude. So good question, but I think the Colts and the Texans are happy with the guys that they have. Yeah, I I don't doubt that's true. Uh, all right, uh, let's talk a little bit about the linebackers and and who's playing there, the inside guys. Every off season, Ken Pittsburgh spins a giant wheel and just brings in whoever it lands on. They have this rotating, revolving door of all, of off ball linebackers. Frankly, it needed it uh, needed it because last year Miles Jack, Robert Spillane, Devin Bush not getting the job done. So this year it's a trio of Cole Holcomb, Quan Alexander, and Alandon Roberts. Uh, Roberts is the base guy, 3-4. He's the the hammer, the thumper, the downhill guy to play the run. Imagine he's going to get a lot of snaps this week to try to combat that Ravens run game. I think Roberts versus Ricard in the hole might have a seismic shift uh, in, in, in Pittsburgh because there's going to be some big collisions there. They've mixed up. There's really not a true every down guy. It was supposed to be Holcomb. Now it's kind of been more of a split, split between him and Alexander. Holcomb, I think, has played more overall. Uh, but there's been a rotation there. So Alexander is a nickel guy who's played in dime as well. Holcomb can play in all three. The group overall has been okay, better than last year's group. It's been energy, intensity, better run defense, but nothing to get ultra excited about. I think Pittsburgh's going to have to eventually draft somebody and find a long-term option through the draft as opposed to this endless string of free agent linebackers they brought in. Well, Patrick Wing could be available next year, so... That'd be that'd be a possibility. I, I think know. he's mad at Mike Tomlin, though. I saw a comment about apparently Tomlin said something to him his rookie year he didn't like. So I don't really? know if there's warm and fire. I don't even know if it's true. Apparently, I think it was Queen said during his rookie year that Tomlin said to him once, "You're not a Raven." And apparently, oh yeah, Queen I did hear that personally. This week. Yeah, so I don't I don't know what's going on there, but uh, maybe one guy that uh, the Steelers will not be able to, to sign this off season. Oh well. But money talks. Uh, money, money can solve a lot of yeah. uh, comments. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, if he, I know Queen is a guy who's gotten kind of upset by things really quickly. So the Ravens drafted a Hamilton with the 14th overall pick or whatever, and he thought, well, the Ravens are going to bring him up and play dime because they've already got safeties. They've got Clark and they've got uh, uh, you know Marcus Williams to play the back end, and so he he's basically being signed to take my spot. 1:04 a.m. that night, he deleted all the Ravens stuff from his Twitter profile. 
<laughs> so, okay. And apparently, I didn't know you could do this, but there's one reporter in particular in Baltimore who follows that. And it's like, he knows exactly when some, when any player has made a oh, change wow. to their Twitter profile. It's like, if you know that that could happen, then you really don't want to be that guy who makes changes <laughs> right, in a reactionary right. way. Just but that's, be- set- that's become the way players have expressed their displeasure. It, that's yeah. been the method. Yeah. All right. Very good. Very good. So let's, let's move it into the secondary now in terms of you, you talked a little bit about, about corners and who's playing there, but, but take us through one more time in terms of the corners mm-hmm. and safeties. Yeah, the base corners, base package is going to be Patrick Peterson, left corner, Levi Wallace, right corner, the safeties, Minka Fitzpatrick, your every down guy. Of course, there's been a rotation. Strong safety used to be Terrell Edmonds, every snap guy, played in Pittsburgh for was it four or five years. Um, he's now in Philadelphia. And so there's been Keanu Neal is more of the three, four run situation guy. DeMonte Casey playing in more you know nickel packages. That's kind of how they, they've divvied up the, the labor overall. This group has been, you know, not as good as it needs to be. The corners have been underwhelming, highly inconsistent. Peterson looks slow. He's given up a touchdown in, I think, maybe three of the four games so far. He's that savvy veteran. I mean, there's some benefit there, but he's not, he's just, he's an old corner and he's played on the outside and had some tough matchups. Do, do they chase at all? Like, will, will, will Peterson be assigned to one particular receiver? Because one of the questions would be, would the Ravens try and put Zay Flowers on that side of the field if if the Steelers won't change from that? No, they do not travel. They have not traveled since like the Ike Taylor days over a decade ago. They play mm-hmm. sides, uh, Peterson left corner, Wallace right corner, and your right offenses can really dictate matchups. They don't even, you know, if you're in a twin receiver set, two receivers to one side, they won't even travel. They'll have the corner just play backside. They'll, they'll kick the linebacker out or drop the safety down. So they do not, in wow. most, maybe some specialty goal line type stuff. But generally speaking, this team does not move its corners. That is, that's interesting. And it, it is important because because corners do oftentimes have a favorite shoulder. And, and it often it often is related to how they like to catch the football, how they like to track the football, they like to track it over. And receivers have that too, by the way. Mm-hmm. And sometimes uh I remember Chris Carter doing a demonstration one time that says he if if the ball is coming out of the wrong shirt, he'd rather turn his body completely around to catch the football than he would try and catch it in the stride over the wrong shoulder. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know the wrong shoulder, <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, but that's that's true of cornerbacks too, and it's not it's not that unusual that they would want to do that. They also may have one hand they want to work with to keep on the receiver to track them while they're looking back for the football, and just they're more comfortable doing that with their dominant hand or their non dominant hand. Um, and uh, the, the the last thing would be that they they like to make a play on the football with their dominant hand. I've always thought, by the way, that that's a fine motor skill that you, you really would pretty much always want to be pl- making a play on the football with your, with your dominant hand. Just think about it in terms of you know, yeah. writing anything. It's a, it seems like a fine motor effort to do that. But there are, there are definitely defensive backs who can do it with either and, and will we'll, uh, we'll go up with the, with the closest hand. It, just, it seems like it's more normal for a, for a player to reach entirely across the body, even though that would take more effort to, to go with the dominant hand. No, it's a really good point, and and I hadn't thought about it in that sense. So I think that's good insight. And we don't talk about that enough. You know, tackles. Some of them, you know, don't they can't play the other tackle side because they're they're yeah. not dominant hand is one side. T.J. Watt did not like playing right outside linebackers rookie year because he likes rushing from the left side more because he his moves work better based on what his dominant hand is. So mm-hmm. that's an element that does not get discussed enough and really has a, an impact on these players. Yeah, so it's amazing because we completely understand it in terms of baseball and all the weaknesses that go along with that being left-handed, mm-hmm. right-handed, but it's, it's really not, not thought of in terms of football. Uh, okay. What else do we want to talk about here? So any, any particular defensive scheme you're expecting that it's not like the Ravens are, are chock full of offensive weapons at this point, and particularly with the weak tackles, I think the Ravens are going to have to do more adjusting to who the Steelers are than the other way around. But is there any particular player among uh, Andrews or Flowers in particular, I guess, that needs some sort of special attention from the Steelers you're expecting? Well, obviously, Mark Andrews, a big time threat, two touchdowns last week. I think the stat is he has three targets in the red zone and they've all been touchdowns. So, you know, those those specialty situations, as you said earlier, there were 12 or 15 in the red zone in terms yep. of converting touchdowns. So they've been amazing in, in situational football. You know, will they have Minka maybe probably take Andrews in some of those third down situations to try to take him away? Probably they're, they're going to mix some stuff up. Uh, just big picture defensively, schematically. Last year, they were one of the more man-heavy teams. This year, they're a zone-heavy team. And I don't have the exact number on that, but they've not been the press man team they were 
last year. Have seen some more two-man and third-down situations, but overall they have been significantly more of a zone personality than a man coverage team, which they were in 2022. Eyes on the football, and we'd expect that with Lamar at quarterback this week anyway, that you you guys would be leaning heavily on zone. And I think definitely the Steelers should expect a lot of zone this week because that's what the Ravens are good at. It's not because not because it necessarily exactly blocks what the what the Steelers can do well. It's because they really need to do it to cover their own corners. And I, what 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 has shown up so far is that the Ravens have to be able to somebody else has to be able to prove to the Ravens that they can't stop the run with the six players in the box. So if the other team can run out of 11 uh, or even run out of 12 and against six players in the box and do it effectively, then it, something might change. But so far it hasn't happened, and the Ravens have only allowed 3.7 yards per pass. So they're very much loath to change from, I think, uh, you know, a zone, the, what they've done well in zone so far. Yeah, that makes sense. And if there are some injuries, a corner, better to play zone than, than try to man up. My other just sure. quick thought, Defending the Ravens offense, always interesting to see how Pittsburgh defends the quarterback design run game, the read option. Pittsburgh in the past has used that mesh charge where the outside linebacker, you know, usually it's a it's a keep or a give read based on where the, the backer goes. But in Pittsburgh, the mesh charge is that backer attacks the quarterback every single time, even if mm. he's giving the ball to force the give and so the Lamar can't beat you. Make you'd rather have Gus Edwards beat you or Justice Hill or Melvin Gordon than Lamar Jackson. Pittsburgh has mixed that in. I don't know if that's their intention this week, but always interesting to see because you guys still run read option and counters and bash, all that kind of stuff. And it, it's a lot of variety in the run game that's certainly difficult to handle. Yeah, that, that is, by the way, a really good point. And there's a certain amount where it's probably better just to flip a coin and say, I'm doing it this way this time than it is trying to actually figure out the mesh read, you know, to, right. to, to read the mesh read. <laughs> so, right. Don't don't read it. That's how you beat the, the read option is don't yeah. read it, just attack. All right, outstanding stuff. Always, always a pleasure talking football with you. Give me one player you think matches up particularly well against the Ravens on offense and defense. And I'm going to say for this game, let's let's leave out TJ Watt because we already know he's going to be a wrecking ball against what whoever the Ravens have at right tackle. Well, let me just mention if I could really quickly special teams because I love my special teams, and and we'll have to see their their punter Presley Harvin had gotten hurt against the Raiders. He did not play against Houston. Uh, he he was a big reason why they beat the Browns and the Raiders. The field flipping ability, he, he had some really booming punts, and so that's important. And the kicker matchup is always fun to watch. You know, Tucker's the goat, and you know the greatest of all time. Chris Boswell, though, man, I mean, he is so money from fifty yards. He has as many career 50 yard field goals as every other Pittsburgh Seagulls kicker in history combined. And I know that obviously kickers have gotten better and more accurate over time, but that stat still kind of wows me. Um, He's been the only guy that can make 50 yarders, you know, in Pittsburgh. So that's going to be a fun battle to watch Um, in terms of your question. So you're asking one player on Pittsburgh side that matches up well, each each side offense and defense. And leave T.J. Watt out of it because we know he'd be the obvious choice on defense. That's the the free space on the bingo card of of that question. Offensively, it's a little hard to maybe try to find that guy right now because Pittsburgh's offense, I mean, George Pickens is, is a more obvious name, but I think Baltimore's going to have a plan to try to take him away overall. Um, You know, could a Jalen Warren, somebody that on third down, the matchups between Smith and Queen and Warren, as you mentioned earlier, are going to be really interesting. I don't know if Warren is the best player to match up, but I want to see that matchup because you got some athletic, physical type of guys, some third down type stuff. I do think Warren can help mitigate some of those off-ball linebacker blitzes and and maybe the more exotic stuff that the Ravens may do on third down. Defensively, you know, I'll give you another another guy here in Larry Okunjobi, the defensive tackle, three oh, tech geez. defensive end. Yeah, you guys know him from from you know the Cleveland yeah. days too. Uh you know, I think he's had a good year. The numbers aren't particularly there. He's only got one sack, but there has been pressure. And if there is some weakness up front for Baltimore along that offensive line, that may be an area where Oak and Joby can can win. And I'll also go Alex Highsmith if Stanley does not play. It sounds like he's going to. I don't know for sure, but uh, Alex Highsmith, his, his inside spin move is one of the most potent individual moves in football, Highsmith and the inside spin. Third down, high leverage situations, he uses it. Um, it has beaten many tackles in his career. It, it would certainly be great if Stanley can play, but honestly, Stanley didn't look very good in the first week before he got hurt. Mm. And I kind of am wondering where is he in his career when he comes back? Honestly, got to come back this year and he's got to play well this year. I think honestly, his greatest career might be over. So wow. we'll, 
We'll what a terrible fall that's been. If he can't yeah. go, who's the the replacement left McCary tackle? McCary has been the starting left tackle since he's been out, so he'll be on that side and available. McCary might play right tackle uh, otherwise because Morgan Moses is probably going to miss this game. So he he was uh, he was an out today. I don't think we've heard officially what the shoulder thing is. They haven't put him on IR yet, but um, you know, anytime you hear shoulder for its offensive tackle, that's very bad. That's like it's almost as bad as shoulder for a quarterback. And um, you, you know it's it's just it's too important a part of your body when you're a when you're an offensive tackle. Can can I just ask you really quickly because I've always wondered this about, about the Ravens. Why why is it every year there is this laundry list of injuries? I know with the whole was it Stephen Saunders and the trainer the strength and, strength and conditioning coach getting fired, and I don't think he was well liked by by them. But you have the injuries this year. Every year it feels like Baltimore has this CVS list of guys that are injured, and I can't understand the commonality there. Yeah, I I'll. I mean, there are a couple things here. So I'll, I'll say this regarding the going into the season, the Ravens really like to play the game of having 57 guys on their roster, including four guys coming off injured reserve. So they have these veterans on the team that they swap in, swap out immediately after the 53 are done. So guys like Brent Urban, Anthony Levine in the past, and, and, and other vested veterans who you have no uh, reason you're going to lose, they go to the practice squad, then they're resigned to the, to the active roster after usually – for the first game or after the first game, Daryl Worley in that group too. Okay. So, so anyway, just just, just four percent of it is that. Okay. Okay. The other ninety six percent is uh, is completely a mystery to me as well. But this year has been one of the worst ever for injuries. The only thing that's differentiated it from other years is that our quarterback isn't hurt yet. Um, and honestly, with both tackles down, I'd say the risk of that is higher than it's ever been in terms of of uh, what I'd look for. You know at going forward jackson's taking some big hits this year it, when you're looking at hits in the pocket um sacks are not that bad for a quarterback generally speaking sacks i'm not saying they're nothing but mm -hmm. but when, when the quarterback takes the sacks he's usually in the process of turtling up and that's not the worst hit you take quarterback hits are the really bad one quarterback is is going through he's released the football is stepping into a throw doing whatever he might do and then he takes a big hit those are huge. You want to avoid those at all costs. And the Ravens have given up some of those. Um, and I'm fearful all the time with Jackson on the run. They've obviously changed the way they run him this year. Um, not this year, but they changed him in 2020 to be an inside threat instead of an outside threat, which is the difference between running pistol, where your pistol back is generally the between the tackles option. And Jackson is your on the edge option. And Jackson on your edge means Jackson runs out, a lot, out of bounds a lot. And that was his MVP season. Mm hmm in in uh in, in since then they've been a sidecar offense speed back uh counter misdirection and jet motion misdirection to try and spread the field horizontally and it was very effective it, you know the, the roman offense was was quite good when when it was running properly when jackson was in there but jackson takes more risk because he's in the middle of the field and he and he might get hit so right. uh you know but as far as the other injuries go I don't have a good answer for you other than it's kind of like the Tampa Bay Rays in terms of they pick up players and continue to hope that players who have some injury proneness can still make it through. And uh, you know, a good, a good example of that. And you, you, all you have to do is have a couple of guys on this that you sign at the beginning of their contract, they get hurt and they're never really the same again, but for the entire time, they're still with you on that second contract. You're still trying to hope that they'll be okay because one, you can't get out of the contract. Right. And Stanley, the first chance is next year. Um, and, and, uh, Dennis Pitta was the same thing, but also, I mean, the Dobbins injuries, you know, maybe Ohio state got his best, you know, that, that, that he had had a lot of carries there and, you know, he, he obviously has not stood up to NFL contact all that well, which is really unfortunate. I wish the guy the best in terms of coming back to the field, but that that's been unfortunate. And, uh, I, I just, I'm, I'm at a loss. It obviously drives me nuts. If, if you ever, you know, I'm glad there's no videotape of me actually watching football from my seats of the stadium because I <laughs> scream like a madman when there's an injury. It's just like, oh, not again, damn it. And, you know, you're, you're just every time somebody's down and it's a purple jersey, you're, you're concerned about, you know, what number is it? Please don't tell me it's 79, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> you know, you're. You're worried. But yeah, anyway, I, I don't really have a good answer for your question, Alex. That's right. the that's the long and, story. And I'm sure nobody does. Otherwise, they would be rectifying the situation. Right. I don't know if it's just bad luck or are, are your camps super physical? I'm just curious how Harbaugh yeah. has conducted training camp. It, it is a highly physical camp. I mean, that that complaint is given. But Harbaugh is very 
um, vet centric in terms of giving people a lot of vet days off. In fact, I, I'm not sure Stanley even practiced once in pads the mm. entire summer. He, he might have might have done it once, but he was out for both of the joint practices with the commanders and all the other padded practices that I attended. So I don't I don't believe he even practiced once in pads the the, the entire wow. time. And then of course he gets into the first game and he um, you know things don't didn't look right even before the injury. Um, you know, for all they do well on the offensive line, they may do some things not particularly well on making sure uh, offensive linemen do not get rolled up. And that's one of the – I'm a big proponent of that. As an offensive line scoring, when somebody blocks the blocks their player across the pocket, you're, you're better off letting the quarterback take that hit than blocking a guy into the back of one of your line mates' legs. Oh, my God, it's the stupidest thing. Yeah, so That's how Dan Moore actually got hurt against Houston. Yeah, he got rolled into go. and hurt his knee. Okay. Uh, I, I, Alex, great. We can go down some rabbit holes together. I'm sure we could talk a couple hours on this because I love talking football with you. Uh, tell folks where they can find your work online. No, I appreciate that, Ken, and likewise for sure. Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter or X or whatever they're calling it these days at Alex underscore Kazora, K-O-Z-O-R-A, and check out the site SteelersDepot.com. On Friday, we'll have, as we do for every opponent, a, a Ravens scouting report, scheme, individual, offense, defense, special teams to break it down and we'll see if Ravens fans think it's a, it's an accurate depiction of what to expect on Sunday. Oh, that'll be fine. I'll take, I'll, I'll make sure I take a look at this. Make sure you f- give Alex a follow. And in fact, I'd, I'd encourage people in general have probably one other um, reporter you follow per team. And if you want a really good one from the Steelers, Alex is your guy, but there's others in the AFC North that, that we could recommend to you. And the know your foe guys are often outstanding. If they're usually, I'm going to Reddit, I'm going to other, places to find out who are the best technical analysts of the game. Obviously you can tell from the way Alex has described things here that, that he's right there in that category. So really appreciate having you on Alec. Uh, Other folks out there, if you'd like to be on a film study short, hit me up with a DM on Twitter. Uh, I will get back to you very quickly and I'm interested in meeting new people uh, to deal with this fan, uh, sorry, uh, guest driven show and, uh, and do as many of those as I can. You just got to be passionate about it. It could be an analytics topic. It could be anything else. Hit me up. We'll make it into a good show idea if you have a a kernel for it. Alex, thanks again for joining me. Yeah, no, appreciate it, Ken. And uh, good luck to you on Sunday. And we'll talk to you next time on Film Study. 